and welcome to the director's chair. I'm Sol Ralston, and this week we'll be featuring Cameron Thomas and his films Ashes to Ashes and Apparition. Before that, though, let's take a look at some film industry news. Apple TV Plus made history over the weekend by being the first streaming service to produce an Oscar Best Picture winner. Their film Coda, a movie about the only hearing member of a deaf family, took home three Academy Awards at Sunday's ceremony, including Best Adapted Screenplay and Best Picture. This win is also a milestone for the deaf community and for disability representation in media. If you share your Netflix passwords with friends or family members, you might have to pay a little more money in the near future. Sharing your password outside of your household violates Netflix's terms of use, and the company has been testing new features to curb password sharing. The biggest change that they've tested is the introduction of member accounts for people outside of the household. These secondary accounts would charge the primary account holder a little bit extra each month. A test of these new features was launched in Chile, Costa Rica, and Peru. If Netflix continues with this plan, it could add $1.6 billion to their total revenue. And finally, feature film production in France is on the rise. According to the country's annual production report, film production has risen on the whole since 2020. The study, which was released on March 28th, shows a 75% increase in film productions, with 1.3 billion euro being invested into French filmmaking. The National Cinema Center approved over 330 films, the national, the average budget rose by 4.2 million euro, and the number of shooting days for these films rose to nearly 7,000 days from 4,000 days in 2020. And we will be right back with this week's films. Welcome back. Let's take a look at this week's films, Ashes to Ashes and Apparition. Asking for forgiveness, huh? I don't want forgiveness. I need answers. You called me down to solve your baby's murder. It's been so long. I still need answers. And now, you're here. How did you find me? You want answers, don't you? Yes, of course I do. I need to know who started that fire. We didn't deserve this. She didn't deserve this. Not her. You need to see the light. It's so far. So dim. Then run. You blame him, Marianne. You blame him for your daughter's death. That's your answer. That's too convenient. Look at you. I can imagine being with anybody else. You could have been so happy. What have you done? You did this. 
Why, Marianne? Why? No! You just can't accept that it was an accident. There was no crime, no mystery, no suspense. You just won't forgive yourself, Marianne. Is this how you treat me? Is that how you treat God? Forgive me. Louder. Repent. Forgive me! I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyone there? Are you there? <laughs> Was this your home? Please answer. I'll ask again. Was this your home? Thank you. Can you give me a sign that you're here? Can you give me a sign? And we will be right back with Cameron Thomas. Welcome back to the director's chair. I'm here with Cameron Thomas, the director of Ashes to Ashes and Apparition. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. All right, so to get started with Ashes to Ashes, what were some of the major inspirations behind this film? I think when I first read the script, the first thing I thought of was Rosemary's Baby. Uh, a lot of like uh, self-discovery through absolution, kind of abstract visions. Um, I, visually, I drew a lot from that. Yeah, and I know that like the concept of absolution and a lot of religious themes really played into it, which is really interesting. And one part that really stuck out to me was at the line, is, that, is this how you treat me? Is that how you treat God? You see the angel character with this almost like broken halo around his hat. I just thought that was so cool and I'm curious if that was like a shot that you planned from the start or if that was just sort of something that came about on set. Yeah it was absolutely something that came about on set which at that point we were kind of having to improvise a lot of shots because we were trying to make up on time and that was one of the ones that we just happened to put the light behind there and it just happened to look that way and we didn't really plan the, uh, the halo effect at all. It wasn't until after the people said, hey, it looks like a halo. It was just we thought it looked good. You know what? It does look good. It looks so <laughs> good. 
And another thing that is just absolutely stunning about this film to me is the sound design. And I'm really curious how that sound design you know, influenced the production and the storytelling of the film. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I had a, like a great double team basically where I had uh, Michael Mercado working on a lot of like the early sound design in the beginning of it, um, really a lot of dialogue mixing and, and atmosphere. And then Rachel, who uh, did a great job with the score and uh, with her assistant Dante, um, they did a great job kind of working together and uh, incorporating the sound design into the score, kind of a very like 70s style of horror uh, soundtracks. Yeah, and Ashes to Ashes is really special in that it was produced for this year's 54 hour film festival. So what was that experience like? Do you have any like fun stories from that? Yeah, I mean it was stressful. Um, I think total, at least when I woke up to start post-production and see the, the rough cut, I had eight hours of sleep total the whole weekend. So I had four hours the first night and four hours the next pretty much. So that was fun, but I mean like, otherwise I, I think I kind of hit a stride where I was no longer sleep deprived and I was just like really wanting to get this thing done. And I think, uh, thankfully my like whole crew felt that way. They were definitely like all very passionate about it and that was really helpful. Yeah, you got so tired you were just energized about it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and I heard that you won best director for, for Ashes to Ashes at this year's 54 Awards Festival. So. Talk a little bit about you, what that award means to you. I think, like anything, being recognized for something that you're really passionate about and like working towards is great. I, I, but I mean, like, this has been a long time coming, me working towards this. So I, th I think that it just felt really good to like be able to see that other people also like appreciate what I had done. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And did it win any other awards at the festival as well? Yeah, I think total we won 14. Oh. Uh, we kind of like uh, cleaned out the student section and then we won I believe two of the professional categories we oh, won wow. best writing overall which that one I was thrilled about I, I could not have been happier to you know work with two co-writers that are like they're so thoughtful with their writing and I, I just love that they managed to get that appreciation and then we got best use of curveball with the the church bell yeah that is amazing so moving on now to Apparition, what were some of the major like inspirations behind Apparition as a film? Yeah, I, I, uh, I think it was really a bit like Italian Jello films. I think at that point in, uh, when I was making films, um, it was for a single cam class and I just, I'd seen a lot of uh, those uh, Jello films recently, uh, specifically Dario Argento and like Lucio Fulci and they're like playing with really interesting lighting. Uh, so yeah, that, and also for the score, Wes Craven was a big influence because I just, I just love the way his scores kind of like are uh, just very much drive the editing and kind of the emotion of everything and especially scare cues that actually work and aren't kind of like overbearing. Yeah, and I know that the lighting is something that's really important to like the feeling of apparition. So what made you choose to go like not dramatic, but like the candles, the like what made you choose that type of lighting to make it so so unique and so I guess yeah very like seventies horror feeling. Yeah, I uh, I think I just thought of like uh, when I, the Ouija board is the first kind of prop that helped me come up with the idea, and that's actually what we got first. And um, then I had the script done, and actually in the script it had talked about you know the candle light kind of being like some of the only lighting. Um, and also like the green light being a really important part of the horror of it and I just love visually that just gave me so much to work with that I like I, I love that and I love whenever writers do stuff like that because it, it just helps me a lot and it helps me visualize what they're trying to say. Yeah and I especially love the color choice of green lighting because I guess you don't really know the ghost's aims yeah. but the green lighting why did you choose green outside of like you I guess red or another color that would have had some different emotional I, I guess I just don't really see green used that much for stuff like that. It's like a very like ethereal kind of type thing, and it, again, it's you see red a lot. And I didn't want like, I didn't want it to kind of represent hell. I want it to be a bit more of like an abstract thing, not w not knowing again, not knowing whether or not it's evil or good or not. I mean, in the end, you don't know, I guess. But you know, I, I just I think green is like a really visually striking color. Yeah, that's great. And one other question that I have about apparition is like the writing process because it has a very like it's mostly just one character talking mm -hmm. uh what was that script writing process like for you um yeah i just again i got i got that ouija board and i put, but i got it from this guy who is like a antiquity salesman he has the most like obscure and strange stuff and i just asked him hey do you have a ouija board and he's like i have five which one do you <laughs> want and i was like i'll take one from the 70s and i actually ended up buying two uh, one that came with the original box and then I kind of set the candles around it, and I asked my uh, my old roommate at the time, Richard Hatfield, who's a great horror writer, 
and who draws a lot of inspiration from those uh, like old horror film directors. And he just like whipped up a script in a couple of days, and that's exactly how it ended up. I love that. Uh, and so one more apparition-related question: Do you believe in ghosts? I've got to I've got to ask since it's a movie <laughs> about ghosts. I have to I have to know: Do you believe in ghosts? I think I'm gonna say no, but I do. I, I like the idea of ghosts. I think that like the human mind always tries to like create uh, you know explanations to the unknown, and so I, I you know I've definitely been in like rooms where something has felt off and I haven't known what it was, but. It, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say no, they don't believe in ghosts, but I, I hope that they are real. Because they, there's something kind of, at least, you know, if it's not them being like tied down to the earth, it's, if it's not like that, and there's kind of our relatives watching over over us, I think there's something chilling, but also very like heartwarming about that. Yeah, yeah, I do like that sort of hopeful skepticism, yeah. almost, yeah. So, what sorts of films and filmmakers inspire you as a director, just like in general? Yeah, I. Uh, when it comes to kind of directing actors and a lot of blocking, I look to directors like Sidney Lumet, uh, Steven Spielberg, and Akira Kurosawa, because they're very careful and very deliberate with the way that they stage their actors and have them move uh, you know, throughout the frame. Uh, when it comes to like visual directors, I, Wes Craven is one of my favorites um, for horror. Uh, when it comes to like, recent directors, I love like Robert Eggers and Ari Aster. I think that th them, what they've done for horror is so good because they're kind of bringing it back to the way it was you know, in the 80s. And it's kind of, they're, they're managing to pull the, it out of that rut of just like jump scares and kind of like the same horror movies that were being churned out. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really cool. And when you're not, like, when you're not directing things, what sorts of roles do you like to fill on a film set? I like to, honestly, I like to kind of do everything. I think the best directors are the ones that kind of like take their uh, shot at each position in the crew, and especially they have to understand every role in the crew. Uh, but I think my favorites are probably maybe ADing, first ADing. I, um, you know, the director and the DP are the heads of creative, but in the, in the long run, the AD is the person who really has to push the production forward and get things coordinated. And I like having that responsibility because I like working with like two big creatives in the director and DP because I learn a lot in seeing their process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what inspired you to like start directing? What you know, made you decide, you know, I want to make films? Man, I don't really know specifically when it was, but I would say it had to have been like fifth or sixth grade, something like that. It, it was really early on that I discovered that I wanted to direct. Um, in fact, I specifically remember in sixth grade, we had like a little sheet that you had to fill out where it was like, oh, what job do you want to have when you get older? And I put film director. And my <laughs> teacher was like, no, you have to put something realistic. <laughs> and I was like, that's fair, but I'm still going to put it because oh, that's yeah. what I want to do. And uh, I, honestly, I think from a really young age, seeing movies like Star Wars and like things that kind of kind of take you to another place and you know embody such like an, an interesting atmosphere and location, that's what I, I just love so much. And I want to be able to make things like that. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And what kind of like stories, when it comes to storytelling, what kind of stories are you really drawn to, I guess, bringing to life? I think anything that uh, requires actors to really kind of, that uh, gives them a challenge. Um, I also really like uh, anything, again, that kind of like transports people. Um, I think when I was younger, I really just wanted to make movies that are fun. But as I've grown older, I've kind of become more interested in, you know, deeper themes and like subtext in writing. Uh, and I, I love the relationship between writers and directors. I, I like writing personally, but I think I find more in working with writers and kind of like helping bring their ideas to the screen. Yeah. And so do you have any like projects that you're working on right now? Yeah, I, I'm actually acting in a project soon uh, called Bolches Bolches. It's going to be directed by uh, one of the writers of Ashes to Ashes, and Michael Glassmeyer. Um, and then I'm also going to be directing like kind of a short conversation piece for my uh, cinematography class. Nice, yeah. What do you think the most important like quality for a director to have is? I think being compassionate and driven. Um, I think you, they have to go hand in hand. Because if you don't have like the drive to kind of go through those really grueling days, because if if you're tired, then the whole crew is gonna not, is gonna like give up and uh, they're not gonna be able to push forward because you're the head, they're who you look towards, and that's the same way with attitude. Um, and I think you have to treat everyone on set the same way. And so um, I think the worst directors are the ones that are kind of like separating themselves from the rest of the crew. Yeah. So, last question: If you had to give any advice to someone that was looking to you try directing and, or you get into filmmaking, what would that advice be? You know, maybe something that you wish that you'd been told before you started or just something that you've learned along the way that you think would really benefit someone who's looking to just give it a try. Yeah, I would say uh, 
So one thing that I really wish I would have done more was that I wish I would have made more projects in high school. Because I think I would have been a better director. I just kind of thought, oh, I don't have the resources. All I have is like a terrible like iPhone that won't be able to make anything good. But I think you just have to go out and make something. And it, it sounds like, like I'm simplifying it, but you really do. It doesn't matter how good it is. You just have to keep going out and making something, and you'll you'll see the growth. I mean, I have just looking at apparitions and ashes to ashes. To me, they're like they're one to two. They're completely different, and I, I really see a lot of growth for, uh, in my direction. And I'm glad that I am able to see that. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have for you. So that is a wrap for this week's episode of the Director's Chair. We'll be back next time with another fantastic film. Until then, thank you for watching. Bye.